Hi there, my name is Jeff and I am uh, with Brilliant Labs here in the Halifax area. I am joined this morning by uh, Ardell Giza, who is a fine art specialist in the Halifax area. She works with lots of different schools and does tons of fun projects. She has done some amazing things with the kids in my class over the years as well. So I am thrilled to have her join me this morning to talk to you guys all about comic characters. How are you doing, Ardell? Oh, not too bad. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to uh, draw and follow along with you. Thank you for the invitation. So I was going to pull up my Google slide presentation. Okay, that's good. Okay, perfect. So cartoon characters and comic books. I usually have students start off with their, developing their own cartoon characters, and then we'll look at comic books a little bit later. So for starting to draw our own cartoon characters, we usually start with the eyes. You could draw cartoon eyes many different ways. These are just a few options that I did very quickly. And on your piece of paper, when you're following along, you can draw a couple of pairs of eyes would be good to start with and have them spaced a little bit apart on your piece of paper. When you're designing your own eyes, think about the shape. Do you want your eyes drawn close together, or do you want a little bit of space between them? Think about if you are going to make a cartoon character that is more robotic in nature, you could have square-ish kind of robotic eyes. You could have baby animal eyes. You could have human eyes. You may already have a way to draw eyes that you have been drawing eyes for a while with. You could add a shine in the eyes by just shading in most of the space of the pupil, but adding or leaving out a little tiny space in one corner of that shape. You could have just simple eyes, little dots are perfectly fine. You could have more details in your eyes. It depends on your style. So Mr. Gettinger, are you going to follow along as well? I am. I, I drew two sets. So I'll see if I can switch this up. So this is my start so far. So just a reminder oh, to those people following along, you are welcome to uh, to just pause the video and give yourself as much time as you need or, you know, go back and look at these again if you wanted to add a new character. So lots of easy ways to, to follow along at home. So after you've drawn a couple of pairs of eyes, I'm going to go to my next slide where we're thinking about the details of the rest of the face. So you could add a nose or a beak shape to your pair of eyes. And they don't have to be the same as each other. They could be different. You could have a different shape altogether. Maybe you would like a square nose. Maybe you'd like a beak instead of a nose. And for a beak, there are usually a couple of dots in the top half of the beak so that the animal can breathe. If you wanted an a upside down triangle nose for a beak, it could also be the nose of a dog or a cat. I drew a couple of examples here. I have an outside circle around a dog nose to give the appearance of a snout. Or you could draw a cat nose and add a couple of whiskers on either side. You could have a side profile kind of a nose. You could think of uh, adding emotions. Maybe you want angry eyebrows and a little bit of a upset character. You could have a happy cartoon character. You can have somebody who's not quite sure what's going on. So think about the shapes of the mouth, just gentle curve lines or squiggles. Think about the inside of the mouth. Would you like the mouth to be opened or closed? If you have an open mouth, would you like a tongue and teeth? There are lots of different ways of drawing all of these items in your cartoon. And after we have the rest of the face drawn, we're going to be looking at maybe we could draw ears or does your character wear a hat or a mask? That is up to you entirely. This is your cartoon character. So on the next slide, I was thinking of cartoon head shapes. So most cartoon people who draw cartoons, cartoonists, if you will, would start by drawing a head shape, which could be the shape of an oval. It could be more circular. If you're drawing a robotic head, you could draw a square shape. And then we just add details to those head shapes. 
So fur lines are very similar to um, the feathers that I had drawn on the previous slide over here with this kind of a, I was picturing an ostrich bird kind of a shape. But I thought, okay, I'll give them some cartoon kind of feathers. Those are just representing, they could be feathers or could be hair. So on my cat slide that I'm showing here, I have a long oval shape and I just built up the features around that oval shape. And then I can erase that oval shape and just be left with the head shape. Same thing with a circle. Maybe your cartoon wants to be more circular. A lot of cartoons are based on circles and ovals. And in the bottom section, I added a circular shape with a side oval shape to create a bunny rabbit kind of a shape head. And then I added a couple of ears, just some basic shape lines, and I added fur lines around the edges. And I did add a mask to my bunny rabbit character in the bottom. So you're gonna think about the shape of the head and draw those in and add some of those details. If your character has ears or spiky hair or fur, completely up to you. Maybe you're drawing a human-like creature. Do you find you people have... find it more difficult to draw animals or humans? What seems to be the uh, a more difficult task to do? Um, the typical way that students have been working with me has been that they would select an animal that they really like. Nice. Maybe they have a pet that they would like to draw. Maybe they have animals that they really enjoy, or maybe there are fantasy creatures out there that they are interested in drawing. But we have had students draw people too. Uh, there is a style called anime that is very popular with some students as well. So when we're, after we've thought of the shape of the head, then we think about the shape of the body. If it's a, we have to think about if your character is a superhero-like character with special powers, or is it just a regular character with no superpowers at all? If your cartoon character is a hero, would it have a cape or a costume, a logo? Does your character have the ability to fly? Does it use wings to fly? Or would it need a jetpack or a cape as a part of their outfit? There are other special powers that your character could have if you were thinking along those lines. Your character could be super fast or super strong. They could shoot fire or shoot bubble gum for their fingertips. You get to think about all of those details. On my example, I did draw a worm-like creature because I was thinking, oh, what if my character doesn't have any legs at all? So I drew a segmented worm and I gave him little arms and he does have the ability to fly with a cape so he can get around. And my little blob, I think he's just going to be kind of like a slug, just kind of slides around. All right. And then after you have the body figured out, you could think of a name for your character. For my cat cartoon character, I could call this character Super Kitty or Sneaky Kitty or Sly Cat. I did draw a C on his logo. So I think I could go with Sly Cat. I just have some random silly names like Bobby Blob or Super Wormy Worm or Jet Doggy. Those are just silly little names. So after you have a, your character's name figured out, you can think of a name for a comic book. So you could have the character's name, you could just have Sly Cat, or you could have The Adventures of Sly Cat or The Amazing Sly Cat. You can think of a descriptive word to describe your character, or you could have Sly Cat versus Jet Doggy and their adventure to find ice cream for their little town. After you've created your own cartoon character, you can now create your own comic book. I'm going to give you a typical format for following in designing your comic book cover. This is just really quick, the next section of the presentation. So here I have Super Spiker the Hedgehog. He could have been a porcupine, but I thought that maybe a porcupine wouldn't have the superpowers that a hedgehog would. So 
So the components of a comic book cover, if you will, I have a title and I have my cartoon character placed just off center so that I have room for a couple of side elements and they would be a rectangular box with three pieces of information in it. The top section, I have the comic company logo. And for mine, I chose Giza Comics. And I have a G with a triangle around it. And that is my logo. So it would be my publishing company, publishing comic company logo. The second piece of information would be the issue number. Here I have issue number one. A lot of people start with issue number one because then we'll, we could write a series. You could have a second comic book called issue number two. Price. Uh, there is usually an indication of price. This comic book is $2.99. Quite affordable. I would buy it. <laughs> I would sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here we have the last element, which is a barcode. It is usually for scanning in stores. Clearly, ours would not be scannable by a barcode scanner in uh, if we're just making a hand-drawn version. That is a fun no. addition, though. I like that. Yeah, it gives it a little bit of authenticity. Yeah. So a barcode is basically a series of lines with numbers. The lines are close together. They are spaced apart. Some are thin, some are thinner. So they have different qualities about them. And then the numbers usually have... <laughs> other meanings, but that's a different lesson <laughs> about uh, country of origin and uh, product identification. And if you look at any product, like maybe a can of soup from your cupboard, you will see a barcode on a can of soup. So if you need extra inspiration for designing your own barcode, you could look there. And ta-da, we have a comic book cover. That's awesome. All the parts come together at the end. Yes. But then I left this cover in black and white for this image. But then I was thinking about color. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what kind of colors I should use. So you can think about your options for color for your own character. You could go with warm colors as seen on the cover. Or you could go with cool colors as seen off to the right hand side. Or you could do a variation of combinations of colors, like this little guy on the bottom corner. And think about what colors you would color each of the parts of your character. I went with orange skin, and then I thought, oh, maybe he would have green skin if he's going to be in the in a tree-like environment. Maybe he has orange skin when he's visiting a fire planet. So think about different parts of your character and what colors you think would look good for your character. I couldn't really decide, so I tried a couple of different variations. I did try yellow skin, but that kind of reminded me of a different cartoon altogether. <laughs> so then I wasn't really happy with that one. Uh, same thing with my red and blue character in the bottom corner. I thought, nah, eh, that doesn't really, I like the color blue a lot, but um, for my comic, I think it's a toss-up for me between the green face character and the warm, fiery colored character. But maybe the character would need a change of outfits for visiting a fire planet and visiting the, the forest plant if my character is intergalactic. Then I do have a section about writing a comic book story. This is very, very basic. But with uh, the first page of the comic book, usually in the top rectangular space, this is called a cell, a rectangular space that tells the story is called a cell, very much like plant cells being rectangular in space, in shape. And then there is usually an inner rectangular space that's blocked off that sets the scene. So you're going to think of a setting, which would be the where and the when. So in my example here, I have it was a dark night in Owl City as just a quick sketch. You could have a different setting. You could be in outer space. You could be under the ocean. You could be in the forest. You could be in the middle of the desert. You could think of a real place like downtown New York City 
You could think of a made up place like, like my owl city. You could have any time of day or night. You could think about the weather. You could think about what year it is. Is it in the past or is it in the future? You get to pick your story setting. We are setting the scene for the story to take place. After you have your setting established, then in a basic comic book, we think of a problem for the hero to solve. So here I have a problem. Somebody is taking a person umbrella that does not belong to them. They're running away. I just drew a couple of quick stick figures for my example. Later on, I can develop those drawings into my good copy of my comic book. Page number two, my hero solves the problem. So my hero swoops in and yells, stop. I'm going to talk about shapes of speech bubbles in a moment or two. The character, the good character, the hero, takes the stolen items from the character who made a bad decision. And then we have a happy ending when the hero returns the stolen items. The person gets to say thank you. And then the hero flies away and says, you're welcome. The end. But you could put to be continued. Maybe there's more going to happen. Using your sketches, you can reflect on your ideas. So I was looking at my quick sketch of Owl City and I thought, how could I make my Owl City look more like an Owl City? I was thinking that owls live in trees. So I have, it was a dark night in Owl City, but now I have owl tree-like buildings in my scene and I have a little person walking over here. I thought maybe instead of stick people, I could have little owls walking around. And there are lots of different people who work on comic books. We have a writer, usually writes the story. We have an artist who illustrates. We have an inker who goes over the pencil lines. We have a person who colors it in called a colorist. We have a person who pencils in all the letters, just works on the text. We have an editor and a publisher. And it's interesting this... to think about that. Like it's not just one person that makes their comic book. It takes a whole team of people to make, make those comic books that we buy in stores. It's kind of cool. That is. And, you know, just in case somebody is thinking that they're not very good at drawing, there are other things for you to do. Or maybe you're really not good at telling stories. Maybe you're better at drawing those. There are different things, different parts. Um, and all of them are important to going into a comic book. A regular speech bubble shape is usually either a squarish box with rounded corners and a little tiny spiky part to indicate the person who is speaking. And if the person is yelling, then it's all a whole bunch of spikes. The shape is made up of a whole bunch of spikes along the outside edge with one extra long spike to indicate who is speaking or yelling. And then there is a thinking speech bubble that I have conveniently down in the bottom corner of this slide where I have this critter thinking with these, the thinking speech bubble. You know, it's like a little cloudy shape with little circles indicating that this is the person who's thinking. Um, owls live in trees. That's what this person is thinking. But he could be thinking, oh, is it recess time yet? <laughs> So thinking about your the shapes of your speech bubbles is one thing that you could be working on as well when you're developing your story. There are very fancy action words that we could also add if we have action that has sound. That's usually a word that's uh, associated with the word onomatopoeia. You'll learn about that later. And I have the word kapow, a big, huge action word. And think about your cell layout. So I have one large cell at the top, but then I have a couple of cells going down and then a bottom cell. So this is everything that's going to happen on the first page. This was my setting and then regular day. And something happens where we have this person taking this owl person's belongings. And this owl person is yelling help. Do you have advice for planning out a, a page's cells? Like, would you usually draw all the cells on the page at first, or do you kind of draw them as you go? What's, what's your preference there? I like starting off with one big cell at the top and then having smaller cells, just a couple 
in the middle. And then for uh, shape, I was thinking about my story and I was thinking about how to tell the story. So when I was planning in my planning stages, it was all very much stick figures and just little tests of blocks. And when I was working on my comic book, I didn't have, I wasn't happy with the layout of my cells. So I changed them. It didn't look like this at the beginning. I had a, this cell over in the left-hand space. And then I had this kapow over in this space. So I had moved them around. I wasn't happy with how I had them arranged the first time. So making a sketch is definitely uh, a good idea to make a plan first when you're yeah. planning your comic out. Yeah, that writing process, it, it applies here too, I guess, eh? making a plan, like a pre-writing and your drafts. And... Yes, definitely. In you. But with ads, I would basically have an advertisement. I'd have a last page for an advertisement. And I would suggest having an ad about either products associated with your comic book, or you could have an advertisement for a new product. Maybe you want to invent hover sneakers, something futuristic, if that goes with your comic. Or you could have the adventures of Sly Cat and Super Spiker, the t-shirt available for $29.99 at Constantinople Mall, wherever that is. Perfect. Just make something up. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Ardell. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us today. Uh, I hope that teachers can either show this with their class or share it with students that they can follow along at their own pace. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye.